Hi everyone, if you're watching this, you most likely know who I am and my story, but if you don't, hi, my name is Abby, I'm 17, from New South Wales, Australia. I suffer from abdominal vascular compression syndromes and this time last year, I was in Germany getting surgery for them. <laughs> Okay, so today I'm going to be sharing with you my my German surgery experience and also my one year post-op update plus answering some questions that you guys left me on Instagram. Let's take it back to the 17th of May 2022. We had flown to Germany and I was having an ultrasound done with Professor Schollback in Leipzig, Germany. This ultrasound took two hours and was done laying down fasted, sitting up fasted, standing fasted, and then repeated those three things after eating and having a sip of liquid. After this ultrasound was done, I was diagnosed with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, severe lumbar lordosis, severe Maytherner syndrome, strong pelvic congestion syndrome, massive and uncompensated lordogenic left renal vein compression, also known as nutcracker syndrome, median arcuate ligament syndrome, also known as MALS, orthostatic pitosis of the right kidney, orthostatic perfusion compromise of the right kidney aggravating the pelvic congestion syndrome, splenic vein compression, Severe SMAS syndrome, also known as superior mesenteric artery syndrome. Compression of the right common iliac vein by the protruding invertebral discs L4 and L5. Compression of the inferior vena cava. After the ultrasound was finished, we started heading towards Dusseldorf by train. I had one night in Dusseldorf before I was then admitted to Clinic Bellatage on the 18th of May 2022 undergoing surgery on the 19th of May. During this surgery, I had a MALS resection done. I had a 20 millimeter PTFE graft placed around my left renal vein, a 16 millimeter PTFE graft placed around my left iliac vein, and my right kidney was pinned to my 11th rib as it was dropping 9.7 centimeters when I would stand. The surgery went for a total of eight hours and when I come out from surgery, I had a drainage tube up my nose and down my throat into my stomach. I had three drains in my stomach, two on the left side, one on the right side. I had a catheter in and I had an epidural catheter as well. On day one or day two post-op, I had the drainage tube removed from my nose which I was very happy about and shortly after the drainage tubes started coming out one by one however one of them was taken out too early causing a lot of leakage and issues um, but it all ended up fine. Some of the things I remember from Clinic Bellatage was the first time I stood up the physio had come into my room about an hour earlier and had me sit on the edge of the bed and sort of move my feet around just to try to get some movement into my legs and my body um, and they said that the next day would be when I walk for the first time but about an hour later I remember the nurses two of the nurses coming in and having me stand up and walk to the window during this process, I remember them yanking on my catheter, which was extremely painful. Um, my mum had to hold me up because I was basically felt like I was going to collapse. I was very weak. I was very dizzy. I couldn't really see. So that was a little bit weird because the physio had said not to do it today, but the nurses sort of just took over a bit. And considering there is a bit of a language barrier, it was a little bit hard to communicate that with them. The clinic has its own cafe downstairs where my parents were able to get meals from each night brought up to the room. There was, you get two meals, um, but because I couldn't really eat, my mum and my dad both would have the meals. I had surgery at the same time as five other people. There was two from New Zealand, one from Iceland, and two from the US. So we all sort of hung out 
in what was called the party room, um, which was just one of the other girls' rooms, uh, which I think really helped me mentally, just gave me people to talk to and other stuff to think about. I remember the physio coming in every single day, twice a day, to take me for a walk around the clinic, which was very nice but very hard. Um, I don't think anyone realises how much you use your stomach muscles in your everyday life, but it was incredibly hard to just walk one lap around this little ward. I can't really remember if every day in the clinic as it was what seemed like forever, but on day seven, I remember being... I remember being relieved that I'd finally found a comfortable position to sleep that night. I was so happy that I was comfortable. But then I needed to go to the bathroom. And when I returned from the bathroom, I remember laying down and being in severe pain. I remember crying for the whole night, shaking, needing needing epidural boluses, which is where they would push um, epidural faster, I guess. Um, skipping to the next week. Day 13, I had a nurse come in to give me my next epidural dose into the machine. And when he did it, he didn't push the air out of the tube like I'd watched all the other nurses do. And I didn't really think anything of it. And then... After he left, the machine started beeping, saying alarm, and then there was another word under it in German, which I obviously could not read, um, and I buzzed the nurse back in, and he silenced the alarm and walked back out, and we're like, okay, um, about five minutes later, it started going off again, and we buzzed him back in, he pulled it out, sort of squeezed the air out of the top, and then connected it back, and walked out again and then about five minutes later it happened again and I buzzed them in and this time a different nurse come in and she checked the line so the epidural there was a green circle that was sitting around here and then the tube went over my shoulder and was going up my spine like up my back and she looked at all the tubing leading up to this green circle point and she just said, air, bubbles, not good. And instantly, like, took the epidural out of the machine and started squeezing half of it into the bin before reconnecting it and draining what was in the tube into the bin as well. Um, because basically, they had almost sent air bubbles up my spine and it was just that this little green circle, I don't know what it's called, um, had stopped it. So I remember being in severe pain for about three hours afterwards because I'd had a break of no epidural. Um, so that was incredibly painful. So eating in the clinic was actually very strange to me because Professor Sandman would constantly say only nine teaspoons per sitting. Um, so I could have nine teaspoons of whatever I wanted and then had to wait several hours before having another nine teaspoons of anything. And there was this one day my mum had gone down to the shop just up the street and brought mini sushis. There was nine mini sushis in, and I mean like this big, um, in this little pack. And my mum placed it in front of me and walked away. She turned around and they were all gone and she was shocked that I could feel pain creeping through and had to ask for extra pain meds. I was able to drink water in the clinic for the first time in two years and honestly people never take water for granted. Like, I really thought that it was such a great sign that I could finally drink water again and it seemed like such a big achievement at the time. I'm going to jump to the day of discharge where my epidural catheter was removed in the morning 
which normally that's removed on about day seven or eight, but mine was kept in until the day of discharge. I had one last dose of IV medication in the clinic. The night before discharge, I had expressed to Professor Sandman my fear of pain management after leaving the clinic and he made it very clear to me that they have a very good management plan and that he was leaving a list of medication at the nurse's desk for them to have organized in the morning. Now the next morning when I was discharged there was no medication list to be found. The nurses had no idea what they were supposed to be giving me and it was very chaotic. I went and sat in the party room waiting for Sandman to come and remove my stitches where that was incredibly painful. We were then discharged and headed off to the hotel we were staying at. There was three of us in Germany and I did not think it would be so hard to find a hotel that had two beds but that is near impossible so my poor dad was sleeping on couch sofas from the day I was discharged until the day we got home. Once we got to the hotel, the only medications we had was Panadol that we had brought from Australia with us to Germany. After discharge, I was incredibly sick. I was in a lot of pain. I was shaking, I was sweating, I was can't explain the pain that I was in and all I could take for it was Panadol. So my dad went back to the clinic and demanded that they give us more medication because this was not working um, and they gave him oxycodone, a pain patch and novulgin drops, I think that's how you say it. Um, now these did not work. I had, we had watched a documentary beforehand called Dope Sick which is about oxycodone and after watching it, I was very scared to take this medication. I was terrified of getting addicted to it and just the side effects of it. So I really did not want to take it, but the pain got to the point where I, I had a 10 milligram tablet and it did nothing. I, considering I didn't want to take it, I didn't take it again because it didn't do anything. I was scared of it. So that was the end of oxycodone. The Novalgin drops were giving me severe heat flushes where I would basically have to drink this bottle when you're only supposed to have 5 to 10 drops. I would get about 5 minutes of relief and then I was in pain again and having to drink this bottle again. Um, so that only really lasted for a day or two because it wasn't an ideal medication. The pain patches also did nothing. Nothing was working. On the 7th of June, after we had done a little bit of walking around, I was in a wheelchair, but after we explored a little bit of Dusseldorf for about 45 minutes to an hour, we returned back to the hotel. Um, I remember coming into the hotel lobby and my parents, the room key wasn't working, so my parents were trying to get that figured out. and. I was sitting sort of a meter or two away from them in my wheelchair and um, the owner of the hotel actually come over to me and asked me if I was okay and I just said yes like I'm I'm okay thank you um, he said can I get you some ice or some soup and I was like I'm like I'm fine it's I'm fine I didn't know he was the owner I just thought he was you know a nice person asking how I was but it turns out he was asking this because I looked like a ghost um, I was very pale, I looked very sick, and my parents going back up to the room, I really started saying, I cannot breathe, there, like, it felt like something was stuck, just started crying, um, my mum called reception and asked them to have a taxi at the door waiting, as she ran me downstairs, I was in pyjamas and socks, we jumped in the taxi and the taxi driver was so sweet he was he could see that I was obviously distressed and that a lot was going on and he's 
looking in his rearview mirror, trying to, he asked me what my name was, where I was from, he started singing a song, he was really sweet. I just felt like there was no air getting in, if that makes sense. We then got to the clinic and my mum ran. When we got in there, my favourite nurse was at the nurse's desk and he just looked at me and said, what's wrong? And my mum said she can't breathe. And I was like this, like I was holding my chest, I was crying, but there was no noise. It was just tears. And he he got down to my level, he held my arms and he said, just breathe. And he had me lay down on the couch in the, I guess you'd say, receptionist area of the clinic. Um where he went and got another nurse, which checked my vitals, they checked my oxygen levels, oxygen is fine, they didn't really know what was wrong, so they were ringing Sandman, and they took me back into the pre-op, post-op room, um, saying that they needed to check my arterial blood, so they took a needle and poked it into my groin, trying to retrieve arterial blood and when he pulled it out he looked at the color of the blood he had drawn and said this is not arterial blood so they then had to go in through my wrist around here he was able to get arterial blood that time and he'd drawn it he put it in the machine to check my hemoglobin levels was about four nurses around me um two of them being students there was um, an anaesthetist who had just drawn the blood and Professor Sandman. Professor Sandman asked what was wrong. I said, it feels like something's stuck. I can't breathe. And he sort of stood there and said, that's impossible. I fixed her to my mum. And machine printed out this bit of paper. They all looked at it, started speaking in German, and then they all started laughing. And that just seems very weird to me because... I obviously don't speak the language, I was in a lot of pain, I couldn't breathe and the situation just could have been handled very differently, I feel. But everything was fine, they said everything was good, to just go back to the hotel and monitor it. So that's what we did. Uh, whilst uh, we were back at the clinic, Sandman gave me clonidine and told me that I should have had this from the beginning. The next day we went on a day trip to Amsterdam. As soon as we got off the train in Amsterdam, I looked at my mum and I said, it's happening again. Feeling of not being able to breathe was slowly starting again. But we'd just gotten here. I, I was trying to just ignore everything around me and just breathe. And it never got to as bad as it did the day before, but I had a lot of chest pain. And the day in Amsterdam, Personally, I did not enjoy Amsterdam. It was raining when we went there. I was in a wheelchair, like I said. My parents were trying to push me. Amsterdam is all cobblestone. Um, so every bump we hit, my stomach, which was full of fluid, was like bouncing pretty much. And it really, really hurt. It was raining. It was quite miserable. So we honestly just went to a movie theater. And... We just watched whatever movie was on next. The theatre was very nice. It was That was sort of our day in Amsterdam. And then we jumped back on a train and went back to Dusseldorf. And We headed to Paris um, a day or two later where I'm just going to straight up say we had the worst luck, we had the worst time in Germany and Europe pretty much um, because when we went to the train station to head to Paris, which we were not supposed to be coming back to Dusseldorf at this point, um, we had packed all of our bags, everything, and headed down to the train station. 
When we got there, our train was delayed. We sat on the platform for five hours before our train was cancelled. I was in a lot of pain. I'd really had enough of it. I was crying. I just wanted to come home. But we then went back to our hotel and the manager gave us back our old room. We stayed there again and then went back to the train station the next day when we were able to get on the train to Paris. It was not an easy tri trip. I will point that out. Um, they stuffed up the tickets. It was a lot. It was chaotic. It was not fun. <laughs> we then, in Paris, we went on a river cruise. We went and saw the Moulin Rouge. Um, we seen the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> positive for COVID. I had been having severe chest pain where I, the only way I could explain it is it felt like contractions in my chest. I would be sleeping and five minutes later wake up screaming because my chest just felt like it was crumbling. Like I, I seriously don't know how to explain it, but that was happening so much. And two weeks later, we started heading home when we could. So we flew home. I was still having really bad chest pain. And when we got to Melbourne, we drove to my grandparents' house in Deneliquin, where they were not there, just to make sure that we weren't going to bring anything home to my family. We stayed in Deneliquin for two nights. Honestly, up until this point and everything else I've explained, I was on... Clonidine, I was basically asleep for a lot of this time. I would, for instance, if we went to a restaurant, I would take clonidine, eat a little bit, and then be knocked out in this restaurant because that's what clonidine does to you. Um, so a lot of this is honestly a blur. I have missed so much and... That was my Germany experience. So basically to put into a conclusion, I did not like Germany. I did not like Europe. Yes, it was most likely because of my situation, but I was not a fan. Um, I cried a lot. I really wanted to come home. But Okay, so time for the long-awaited one-year post-op update. I will say that I am very sorry that we have not done an update for around 10 months now, but we honestly do not know what to say. Um, I just want to start off with thank you to every single person that donated um, and shared my my cause page so that I could get to Germany because at the time Germany is what seemed like life or death thank you from the bottom of my heart and my parents heart for everything all right so the surgery has not given us the outcome that we wanted unfortunately and as much as I hate to say it, I do not notice a difference besides a few symptoms, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and say what symptoms I'm suffering from right now. Um, 
I've had severe back pain since I had surgery, which I did not have beforehand, in the areas of the stents and the or the grafts and my pinned kidney. And when I say severe, I mean to the point where sitting is very painful and walking and standing is near impossible due to this pain. Um, we're not sure why this is happening, if it's the stents. I know of a few people that um, have had the same issue and we're sort of just waiting to see what some test results come back with and if it's the stent causing it. But as of right now, I do not know why this pain has started. Uh, I still have 99% of the same problems when it comes to eating and drinking. I can only drink Gatorade. I've lately been trying to drink ginger ale whenever I have some sort of food as a lot of people say ginger ale helps with nausea. So I've been trying that out. Um, but when it comes to eating and drinking, I still have a lot of pain, nausea. I end up in bed with a heat pack curled in a ball after I eat anything. I basically only eat one meal a day and a few snacks throughout the day. My legs. Since surgery, I've been having a ton of issues with my legs. Um, I'll start with saying for this entire video, I have not been able to feel my legs. They are, besides getting a shooting pain down them, every few minutes, I cannot feel them. Um, this issue got a lot worse about two and a half weeks ago where I really started complaining, Mum, I cannot feel my legs. Um, about a week ago, I stood up to take our dogs outside to go to the toilet and I looked down because my legs felt like they were on fire and that just felt like there was a lot of pressure and when I looked down, my veins were bulging out in my feet which you have not been able to see my veins for the past three years because I've been dehydrated and these veins were bulging out, my feet were red, everything was hot and normally my legs are freezing cold. Um, but they were burning hot, very painful. Um, my mum had to basically carry me back to bed because I couldn't walk. Um, and this issue has been happening since that day where whenever I stand up, I almost collapsed to the floor crying because it really hurts and my veins are bulging and my legs are hot and just I can't feel them 24-7 besides shooting pain every so often. I've been having a ton of issues with my bowels since surgery which is one of the main reasons I ended up with a pick line in August 2022. Um, having that pick line where I would have um, a liter of fluid three times a week um, really like the smallest bit but made such a difference I felt like I had more energy after I left the hospital after every bag it was just generally amazing to have fluids although I only had the pick line for a month before we headed back overseas where we stopped we're going to America um, and we went back to Schollback in Lipseg, Germany, where he rescanned me. So let's get into that. My second scan was Schollback. I noticed, we all noticed that I was in a lot more pain during this ultrasound. In my first scan that I had with him before surgery, I... It just felt like a normal ultrasound. It hurt when he pushed in certain spots, but nothing extreme. At this time, I was bawling my eyes out almost from the second that probe touched my stomach. And I could not stop because it was unbelievably painful. And basically, all he could see was that I was had mass gas production after I ate anything or took a sip of any liquid. That was basically all he could tell us. 
he said that left renal vein stent was measuring 12 millimeters um we all sort of looked confused and said no that was 20 millimeters and he said no it's, it's 12 and we all sort of like argued about it for a second because it was 20 millimeters and he basically said that the stent can I don't even know what the word was but it can get I don't know encapsulated to that size pretty much um which we thought was quite strange but anyway he did keep saying surgery was such a great success but and then would list multiple things but what he did find was that I still have an indent in my celiac artery which he's not sure if that is the nerves causing that or if it was just compressed for so long that I now has an indent in it. Other than that, he sort of thought everything was looking better than it was before surgery. He did say my splenic vein compression had gotten worse since the surgery, but he didn't really tell us what to do, so we just sort of pushed that to the back of our minds, I guess. But that was pretty much the result of that ultrasound he did want us to go back to salmon and have a duodenoscopy but at the time i had a very bad head cold flying was just not really in the question at the moment nor was getting on a train and we didn't really want me to be going under anesthesia um before getting on a 12 hour flight so we decided that we would wait until we got home to do this it was also going to cost a lot of money so we thought we'll wait till we get home we can get this done in australia so after we returned to australia we started seeking out someone to do this duodenoscopy which turned out to be a lot harder than we expected and four months later i had a gastroscopy they said that they couldn't find anything and they were supposed to take um, swabs for mast cell activation syndrome. And I asked the doctor to check for SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is very common after surgery. And she said to me that that is not something they can look for due to it only being a gastroscopy. So we sort of said, yep, okay, she was whatever and afterwards she come out and said there's no cybo we were very confused about because she said she couldn't even reach where it would be so it was just very confusing as it always is in australia but that was sort of where that ended up but pretty much as of right now i rely on a wheelchair to leave the house i cannot do much i have to go to the hairdressers once a week to get my hair washed as i cannot do it myself due to severe pain in my shoulders and neck which i've been having really bad since surgery i basically don't get out of bed much i go down to my old dance studio once a week if i can just to watch um, other than that i really go to coles to get groceries with my mum, and that's about it i that's where I'm at right now. Right now, we're trying to figure out the best way to move forward, whether that be with, do I need nutritional support? Do I need hydration support? Just trying to figure out what's going to be most beneficial for me from this point. Okay, so if you follow me on Instagram, you know I posted a Q&A box for people to leave questions for me to answer in this video. So I will get to those now. First one is, what does my tattoo say? Um, I have one tattoo that says, somebody's problem, which is a Morgan Wallen song. And my parents both have somebody on their arms because I'm their problem. So I'm somebody's problem. And I have a tattoo on my leg that says life changes out of the blue, which is a lyric from a Hardy song called One Beer. And I just feel like it really relates to my story. The song doesn't, but that lyric does. So yeah. How much pain do you have now or gone or is it better? 
like I sort of said before, no. My pain is not better. It is a tiny bit worse in some aspects, but unfortunately not. I still have a lot of pain and basically no quality of life still. When did you realize you were sick? I realized I was sick the day that I'd been having a lot of blood noses, I couldn't look at screens, I'd been having a lot of these weird rashes. But on this one day in particular, I was laying on the couch and asked my brother to help me up. And when he pulled my arm, I fell to the floor screaming because it just felt like the world was collapsing. My ears were high pitch ringing, my vision was gone, my head was pounding, my heart was pounding, my legs felt weak. It literally felt like my world was collapsing. That was sort of the day that I realized that something was wrong. What's your next step? Honestly, I don't know. As of right now, we did, I had three days of testing this week. I had a gastric emptying study small bowel series done. I had an ultrasound and I had an MRI done and we'll just sort of see what comes from that and make a decision from there really. Can you do a day in the life on TikTok? I can, however, my day consists of me laying in bed. I will try and do a day in the life on TikTok when I know I'm going to be doing stuff because otherwise you'll literally just be watching me lay in bed all day. What's one thing you would do differently if you had to redo the last three years? everything I think <laughs> I would have first of all found out what virus I had when I first got sick everyday viral infection is what caused all of this to happen so I would love to know what that virus was and I would have fought harder for nutritional support in 2020 and 2021 because I feel like a lot of this could have been avoided if I had had adequate nutrition from the beginning but I try not to dwell on what I could have changed because I did not know this was going to be my life I didn't know what to expect so yeah was the surgery painful yes it was it was extremely painful I was on pretty good medication whilst I was in the clinic but it was still very painful. It was an open abdominal surgery, so any open surgery is going to be very painful. But who all traveled and where were they able to stay near you? Okay, so my mum and dad traveled with me to Germany. My mum stayed in the clinic. So in Clinic Bellatage, in the rooms, there's two beds. So there was one for me and one for my mum. My dad was staying at a hotel just down the street and would come to the clinic every day, all day until it was night and would head back to the hotel. However, on the first weekend that I was there, so on the Friday night, the first Friday night I was in there, um, the night nurse actually brought in a, a third bed for my dad. So my dad was able to stay with us for the weekend because I had no new patients over the weekend. So that was really nice having like the three of us all together. Um, but then on the Monday they had to take that bed back out and my dad was back at the hotel. Did you physically prepare your body prior to having surgery? Fluids, therapy, etc.? No, because I couldn't. I think if I had have had a pick line for fluids or something like that for having surgery, I think that would have made difference because my body wasn't prepared for it, but, you know, in Australia... For me, it is very hard to find help here, so it sort of just wasn't really an option at the time, but yeah. What are the, some of the everyday ac activities you struggle with? All of them. I struggle with showering. I struggle with just walking around the house. I struggle with eating. I struggle with seeing in a car. You wouldn't know it, but right now I'm in severe pain. <laughs> I struggle with basically everything. I can't do any jobs for my parents. I can't put the washing on the line or anything. I sort of just stay in bed like a couch potato just because that's all I can really do. What would you say the essentials are when having surgery? Ooh. I 
would say a small fan. Oh my lord, do I wish I had a small fan. Um, I found it surgery to cause a lot of heat flushes. Um, it was not very pleasant. I really wish I had a fan. Um, I'd say a nice soft blanket because honestly, they're just comf comforting, comfortable. Just makes it feel a bit more like home, I guess. A pillow or a like stuffed animal to hold against your stomach whenever you stand up, sneeze, cough, basically do anything for the first few weeks to months after surgery because those things are very painful. I personally brought my childhood teddy. Um, it was just a comforting thing. I feel like no matter how old you get, having something to comfort you in such a stressful situation is quite important. I would also say I brought pictures um, from home that I'd printed out and stuck them on the wall just to make it that homey feeling. I had photos of everyone that I knew I was going to miss when I was away, so close friends and family, pets, just sort of stuff that I knew I was going to miss and want to look at. So I did that, which I think was really nice. Yeah, I think just finding stuff that makes you comfortable is really essential. <laughs> what was the most memorable part of your experience? Well, I'd love to say just coming home. <laughs> As you can tell, I did not enjoy my trip with COVID and all the troubles that we ended up having and our bad luck I'd say going on probably just seeing the Eiffel Tower with my mum and dad was special I was in a lot of pain at the time though so I was sort of a bit out of it but I feel like it was just a special sort of moment but most memorable part would have to be coming home do you ever regret getting the operation would you do it differently if you could go back Okay, this is hard for me to answer because we made the best decision we could at the time with the information that we had. However, with the information that I now have, I wouldn't have gone ahead with the surgery. I try not to regret it because at the time we thought this was going to change my life and it did, just not in the way we wanted it to. If I could go back though, I would have gone and had testing done and then done some of my some more of my own research and reached out to some more people before deciding to ultimately go ahead with the surgery. Are you still sick? Are you having another surgery? Yes, I am still sick. I do not know if I'm having another surgery. At this point, no. We're sort of just waiting to see what's going to happen and we'll speak to some specialists about what is the best thing to do moving forward and what's going to give me the best chance at a better life. Where do you go from here? Like I said, I'm not sure. <laughs> Are you still having difficulty eating? Yes, I still get severe pain, nausea, I have to have a heat pack and laying in the fetal position after I eat anything, which is what I said earlier, but Yes, I still have a lot of issues with eating. What did you find the most challenging after undergoing such a big operation? Everything. Going from laying to sitting to standing. I never thought that's something that I would find hard, but I found it very hard. But just walking around, just moving was very hard and I didn't know it was going to be that hard. What's next for your treatment plan? At this point, we are kind of sitting ducks. We are just waiting for instructions from my dietitian, from my GI doctor. We're finding it very hard to find a doctor to help us, but we're trying. How are you feeling now? I feel as though I am stuck in a body causing me pain 24 seven.
Did your Germany surgery help you at all? I don't know how to answer this, to be completely honest. I want to say it did. I really do. But it's very hard for me to see any positives when 99.99% of everything I'm going through isn't positive. But how did your symptoms change after surgery? Like I said, I got new back pain, which I'd never had before. Um, most of my symptoms sort of stayed the same. I'd say I had about three months of relief whilst I was on clonidine before I started noticing that I was in all of the same pain again. What was the process of reaching out and consulting with the German doctors like? After we discovered Professor Samman and Professor Schollback, my mum had sent an email to the both of them explaining my full story. At this point, I had been diagnosed with MALS and a radiologist had found Nutcracker Syndrome on a scan of mine, but the doctor completely dismissed it. So I say I had MALS and Nutcracker, gastroparesis and POTS at the time mum sent these emails and they both replied within an hour or so saying what they could see on my scans that we sent and from that point it was kind of just going back and forth about appointment dates and cost and next thing I knew we were there so it just they were very easy to communicate with about getting there and appointments and the surgery itself what are some comments you hate getting from people this is a big one. I feel like what people think are compliments actually hurt the most. Hearing the words, but you look fine, or but you look good, honestly, feels very dismissive to me because from the outside, I might look fine, but from the inside, I am in excruciating pain and... Honestly, I find it very weird how people say this because they will say this and then I'll see a photo of myself from that same day and it makes me feel sick because to me, I physically look sick on the outside, but everyone always says I look fine, so that kind of confuses me a little bit. But that's probably my biggest one is, but you look fine, you look good. So, I mean, I appreciate it, thank you for the compliment, but it just feels dismissive in a way. What tests were positive and what was the breakthrough in gaining an accurate diagnosis? The accurate diagnosis was from Professor Schollback's Pixel Flux Doppler Ultrasound, which I'm pretty sure he's the only person that has this program, but that was my way of gaining an accurate diagnosis. Was it worth it for you? I'm not sure. I, like I said, we made the best decision we could with the information we had in the situation we were in. Would I do it again? No. But that's because of the information that I have now. How many scars do you have and are you insecure about them? I have 17 scars. I have three very small ones on my neck from the central line. I have two very small ones on the left hand side of my stomach from the drains. I have one on my right hand side from the drain. I have another one above that from where my they went in to pin my kidney. I have my midline scar is 24 centimeters long which is 9.5 inches and it has two small scars from the stitches along the side of it, um, all down it, one from my pick line. What is your remaining issues? I think I've covered that, but basically I just, eating, drinking, walking, standing, sitting, not a question, just absolutely adore you, thank you. Are your doctors considering a feeding tube? Honestly, I have no idea what my doctors are considering because they're not very good at communicating.
We're sort of just gonna wait and see what happens and see what they decide to do. I think now it's just a waiting game. Do you still have gastroparesis or was it SMAS slash mouth symptoms and you didn't know it yet? Yes, I still have gastroparesis. When we first saw Shoal back, he said, you don't have gastroparesis, it's just SMAS. Your duodenum is compressed to 1.3 millimeters. So that's where your gastroparesis symptoms are coming from, but it's not gastroparesis. However, once we returned home from Germany, they did another gastric emptying study, which showed that yes, I still have gastroparesis. So yes, I do. What helps you deal with pain? Music is a big one for me. I cannot express how much Morgan Wallen and Hardy music has gotten me through. I literally every painful moment, every painful test, their music has got me through it. Other than that, my dog helps me a lot. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I know you have been to Professor Shellback again. What did he say? What's wrong with you? I think I have covered this. Um, but basically, he couldn't give us too much information besides he could see that my that I had gas that I had mass gas production from food and water. However, the gastroscopy that was done says that I don't. So we're kind of confused about that. What conditions, diagnosis are at the top of your list to pursue right now? I don't know because I don't have a name to my issues. I think right now my doctors are focused on helping the pain with pain meds which I'm not keen about but I think we're just trying to get figure out if nutritional support is going to help or hydration like I said just trying to figure out what's going to be the best option. Do you get the same symptoms every time you ate or did it come and go? I would get the same symptoms after everything I had to eat and drink and that still happens now so no it does not come and go the last one is would you recommend going to Germany for surgery I have mouths and heard mixed experiences I just want to say that every person is different my outcome is going to be different to your outcome to point to perspective the five other girls that I had surgery with are doing much better than I am so every person is different it one surgery is not going to work for every single person everybody is different which means that every outcome will be different so it's hard for me to answer that question but I will say that Professor Schollback's ultrasound is life-changing um, however make sure you really do your own research and get multiple opinions and speak to multiple different doctors and people before you really make a decision but whatever feels right to you is what i think you should do that is it i really hope this video made sense there's a lot that i missed because i've tried very hard to block out most of my experience so I'm not really trying to relive it all, but that's the most of it. And thank you for watching. <laughs>